All roads do lead to Sumar. Uh, I know when I was growing up, and probably for most of you folks, uh, we were always taught that e ancient Egypt was the world's first great civilization, you know, and I was somewhat nonplussed to find that quite the contrary, uh, ancient Egypt is, it, with all its finery, was just a degraded version of the Sumerian civilization. Uh, and again, we have to go back to the earliest civilizations, and then you find that everything degraded. Uh, the Egyptian dynasties, the earliest ones, they had the best jewelry, the best architecture. They had the knowledge, and then it, it degenerated from there. Uh, they, uh, they knew about the planets. In this steel, we find the, uh, uh, all the planets are listed and their proper uh, proportion. And yet, uh, Neptune was not found until 19, uh, oh, whatever it says, uh, 1846. And Pluto, they, they didn't know about Pluto until 1930. And yet, the Sumerians, all those many thousands of years ago, had them correctly positioned in the solar system. <clears throat> and we know more about the ancient Sumerians than we'll ever know about the ancient Egyptians or Romans because the Sumerians wrote all of their documents down on clay tablets uh, with a stylus uh, creating cuneiform writing and then baked them. And there's like a hundred, th there's like half million of them still existing and they're scattered all throughout museums around the world but mostly buried in the basement. And only about 20% of them have been translated. And then now we get into people like that Zachariah Zitchin who are translating them, but it's not just him. There's a R.A. Boulay, there's a C.L. Turnage, uh, my friend Michael Tellinger. Uh, there, I, I could go on and on. There's a whole list of people. Uh, the only real criticism of Sitchin, uh, if you really stop and look at it, is not so much his translations. The translations are all pretty much the same. The difference is his interpretation, okay? And, uh, and yet when you hear his interpretation and then line that up with the ancient astronaut theory that was kick-started by von Däniken all those years ago, it all begins to make more and more sense. In these tablets, on more than one occasion, they tell of the origin of human beings. And they say 432,000 years ago, the Anunnaki came. And uh, that uh, they came through the Great Belt, which is probably the asteroid belt. And then they landed uh, in the, crashed down in the Persian Gulf, just like our early astronauts crashed down in the ocean. And uh, they began to colonize. And they were here apparently after gold. Now, we, we all know gold is is uh, uh, worth a lot, but apparently they had another reason for it, and that was to try to repair damage to their home world's atmosphere. Now, if that sounds silly to you, you might consider that Edward Teller, uh, the grandfather of the hydrogen bomb, uh, his solution for ozone holes was to put particles of gold or other heavy metals in the upper atmosphere to reflect ultraviolet rays and hold down what's come to be known as global warming. You don't hear about global warming much anymore because uh, too, much, too much politics going on there. But now they call it uh, climate, climate change, change. yeah. Um, but the Anunnaki, here, you, here are these astronauts and they're on another world and they started basically first trying to extract gold out of the Persian Gulf. That's a slow, laborious, and inefficient process. So before long, they found they could do better by mining. So they went to South America and South Africa, and where there are still hundreds, perhaps thousands, of ancient gold mines. And uh, they started doing that. But then this created problems because, uh, you know, these guys said, hey, and we signed up to be astronauts. We didn't sign up to be miners, and this is tough work. And uh, so there's some arguments, some strikes, uh, and as you can imagine, just like what happened right here, uh, if you know anything about our labor, labor movement and the Ludlow Massacre and all like that, you know, the, the, a lot of them, the Anunnaki leaders said, okay, well, just shoot them, you know, or, 
or put them in prison or whatever, and, but others said, no, surely we can reach some kind of accommodation. And so their science officer, Inky, uh, says, well, I've been working with these earth primitives there in my laboratory in the Abzug, which they determine is Africa. Um, he says, I think that we could uh, tweak their DNA a little bit and produce uh, a worker race that could do the job for us, let them do all the heavy work. And uh, interestingly enough, even in the Sumerian tablets, they have the same ethical arguments that we're having today about maybe it's not proper to uh, clone people and to mess with DNA and all like that. But, you know, and as they in themselves said, you know, since it's not up to us to play God. But Inky finally convinced him. He says, look, we're not playing God. And we're not creating anything. We're just improving the breed. Oops, well, wait a minute. That's what we do with horses and cows and dogs and cats, you know. Except instead of improving the breed through selective breeding, they did it with DNA manipulation. And that's really quite, quite interesting. Um, they even explained exactly how they did this on, by, by creating this first hybrid. They took the... Um, sperm of an Anunnaki male, and then they impregnated the uh, ovum of an Anunnaki female uh, who carried it to term, and then they had to perform a cesarean section, and uh, the earth man was born that they call the Adam, or the Adama, interestingly enough. And uh, that's this thing of the DNA, their, their obvious knowledge and manipulation of DAA, really got me going because I kept thinking back to Bible school and the story of Noah and uh, the ark, which they just made a big motion picture out of with Russell Crowe, and I'm sure it's got lots of great special effects, but we still in all, we get this picture of thousands of animals crawling on this boat, okay? Well, I always had a problem with that. You're telling me the lions lay down next to the gazelles, you know? Besides that, they're all going to go to the bathroom. Where, how do you handle that, you know? I might have figured that one out. I, I hear that on boats there's a poop deck. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but then when I learn about the, their knowledge and manipulation of DNA, uh, then you also realize that the Sumerian tablets carry a story of the Great Flood. And in their version, there is also a person who is told by his God that they're, they're going to try to wipe out the humans and that uh, he better build a boat and tells him how to make it, tells him how to uh, seal it with pitch and bitumen. Uh, and, uh, but there's only two differences between the version of the Sumerians and the version in the Bible. And one is the name. In the Bible, we know him as Noah. In the Sumerian version, there's a couple of names, but Utner Pishkin is one of them. But that's just the name changes because of the language. But the one that really got me was, in the Bible it says he took two of every living thing. And in the Sumerian account, it says he took the seed of every living thing. Oh, wait a minute. Now, instead of a boatload of animals, you've got a closet on the boat with DNA tissue in it. And uh, you use that to repopulate the world. Makes a little more sense. We know about the Baghdad battery. We know that they had the ability to create electricity. And this is pretty primitive. What I'm sure some of you have already heard discussed in some of the programs on this, uh, uh, at this uh, meetings out here is the uh, power generation by drawing power from the earth, drawing power from ley lines, drawing power from uh, just from the air, uh, zero point gravity. Uh, so there's a lot of ways of determining and getting energy and apparently they had access to some of this. Um, I'm convinced the Great Pyramid uh, it was a power generator um, because uh, in Egypt everywhere I went there's hieroglyphics except in the Great Pyramid. And uh, there are niches and, and places obviously for equipment in the Great Pyramid, but we no longer have access to that. You can thank Napoleon for that and, and other fine Christian armies who said, what's that? We don't know. It's got to be of the devil. And they took it all out and burned it and threw it all away. So we, all we're left with is the monument. 
<clears throat> we also can see that the ancient Egyptians, that some of this hand-me-down knowledge from the Sumerians, they were still possessing it because they had what they call the Jed pillar. And you can see here, the, the Jed pillars are connected by wire to these globe uh, looking things and uh, we're not sure how all that worked but uh, it worked they also had knowledge of the white powder the mafus uh, or, uh, or manna and the uh, Egyptian pharaohs uh, this was a great part of their ceremony uh, in the book of the dead on their way to the uh, to the uh, afterlife they would stop at each stage and say what is it and uh, all of this knowledge from Sumeria was ended up tra being transferred to Egypt, which just suddenly sprang full bore into a full-blown civilization. And how did they do that? Well, pretty obvious through the biblical patriarch Abraham. Now, if you go back and study your Bible, you'll find that it didn't say Abraham the Jew or Abraham the, the uh, Egyptian or... Palestinian, it says he came from Ur of Chaldea. Well, Ur is one of the principal cities, and my little pointer is not working. Uh, it is. I can't see it. Anyway, down there at the bottom, you, near the near the Persian Gulf, you can see Ur, and um, and it, it was named. And then the other Sumerian cities, Uruk and Erak, and these were named after um, um, Abraham's. Uh, relatives. So Abraham was not Jewish. He was not a desert, you know, nomad. Uh, he was a very well-to-do, uh, well-positioned Sumerian. And he travels and goes to Egypt and pretty quickly and all, all that knowledge has been passed and the whole Egyptian civilization comes into being. Um, now this knowledge then was resided in the Egyptian mystery school. And one of the people who undoubtedly was well-schooled in the Egyptian mystery school was Amenhotep IV, son of Amenhotep III. Now, Amenhotep III uh, was kind of a badass, and he's the one who decided he didn't want someone uh, pretending to be a successor to his throne, so he ordered that if any of his wives uh, were to have a male offspring, they were to be put to death. Now, this makes a whole lot more sense than trying to kill every male child of all your slaves, right? This, this was about a royal ascension. And sure enough, one of, uh, one of his wives gave birth to a male, and they, like any mother would do, she wants to preserve him, so they put him in a basket, and they floated him down the Nile, and down to the home of their slaves, who were the Hebrews. And the Hebrews raised him, all right? And that's why that when he finally got old enough and Amenhotep III died and he ascended to the throne and became Pharaoh, he changed his name from Amenhotep IV to Akhenaten, the, the worshiper of the one true God. And how did he get on to all that? Well, because he was raised by the Hebrews who were already worshiping the monolithic God. Okay, so now he, uh, he started shutting down all of the, uh, the uh, temples and all the various uh, uh, worshipings of the, of the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian gods. And you can imagine how that set with the priesthood. They didn't like that. But he was a pharaoh, which means he's supposed to be of the gods, so they can't kill him. But what they can do is run him off, okay, and they banish him. So they said, you're going to have to leave. And they said, take your family with you. Well, he didn't take his birth family. He took the family that raised him, the Hebrews. And they took their relatives and their relatives, and uh, they told them, take whatever you want, okay? Well, of course, what they meant was take all your belongings and, you know, sheep, goats, whatever you have. But they took that as a license to seal, and so they grabbed everything. They grabbed everything they could get their hands on, and they took off. And then, you know, the familiar story of how the Pharaoh's army chases after them, and they got into the Sea of Reeds, 
down near the Red Sea, and then then we get various stories. Sometimes they say the war chariots of the Pharaohs bogged down in the in the marshy area and they couldn't follow them. And of course, then we get the story of the seas opening up. And anyway, they got away. So it turns out that Moses is not really a name; it's a title. And Moses means the pretender to the throne. Okay, so Moses, and the, even the Bible said that Moses was uh, educated as a high Egyptian. He was taught all the secrets of the Anunnaki. And uh, here you can see uh, that the stories are just identical. Uh, but, you know, we get one version on Moses in the Bible, and the other comes from the uh, hieroglyphics of the Egyptians. But they tell the same story. But... Uh, so where did Moses, uh, when they got into the promised land and they were traveling through the desert for 40 years, uh, what kept them from starving to death? Uh, well, they'd wake up in the morning and there'd be a white powder lying around on the ground. And they, they ask, what is it? And in ancient Hebrew, the word for uh, the term for what is it is manna. So they'd pick up this manna and they'd roll it into little cakes and they'd bake it and they'd eat it. And everybody got along and they survived quite well. Well, well what is this manna? What, what is it? It's the white powder. It's the white powder, the, the mafus, the conical bread that the Egyptians were using and that Moses knew about because of his knowledge of these ancient technologies and secrets. And... Uh, we now know that this white powder is what they call orbitally rearranged monatomic elements, single cell um, elements and that can change through uh, a smelting process. For one thing, <laughs> when I was a kid back here, that, that was the atom that we taught, were taught back about the time Disney was showing us our friend the atom. This is what we know an atom looks like now, and it's, uh, it's really quite incredible and quite complicated. And uh, the main thing about an atom is you've got your little nucleus, and then you've got a few protons and neutrons rolling around, but for the most part, an atom is empty space. Now, this is, gets pretty weird, but this is getting to the crux of the matter. The whole universe is simply atoms neutrons and protons floating all around, but they bunch together and form something fairly solid. This solid table seems there, you know, you don't want to bang your head on it, it'll hurt. And yet, scientifically, we know that this is just a bunch of excited atoms. And, at, and these atoms are mostly empty space. And I think this this explains a lot of uh, phenomena, you know, people who are able to suddenly lift heavy weights or, or ghosts and they're able to move through walls because it's all mostly empty space. If you can allow your empty space with that empty space, you ought to be able to just slip on through. But that's pretty much out of the range of most of us. Uh, they are using this same type of monolithic, uh, monotonic gold uh, to, to uh, in experimenting on the new fuel cell technology. Uh, and th this is just a list of some of the scientific papers. You don't hear much about this because it's pretty, uh, it's pretty obscure and it's pretty esoteric and uh, it probably would cause a lot of problems to some of the uh, uh, monopolies. Uh, that certain groups and certain families have on energy, pharmaceuticals, etc. But uh, they, these papers show quite clearly that, it's, uh, that this is, again, a means of, uh, of, of manipulating energy. Uh, for example, the, uh, uh, in the monatomic gold, the, the uh, atom tends to sh distort during this change from a solid to a, uh, through a gaseous to this white powder, and it assumes a dumbbell shape. I found that real interesting because to me it looks really similar to the symbol for infinity. But the real clincher is, is that they found when they put this white powder in a weighing uh, scale, 
the, the pan they put it in weighs 44% less than it did before you put the powder in it. So it, it has anti-gravitic properties. And so this is things that we need to be looking at about to power anti-gravity vehicles. Uh, and because the whole universe is energy and if you think of the galaxies and how they all swirl, have you ever thought about what makes them swirl? Why do they turn? Okay. And so what we're finding is, is that with a swirling motion, you can get a lot of power. Just ask a tornado. So we are finally beginning to unlock some of these secrets of the universe, and it has very little or nothing to do with ram jets <laughs> and, and uh, fuels. Um, another illustration of the, of the white powder of gold in operation is the story of Moses, who goes up to the, uh, uh, Mount, uh, the Mount of Moses up on the mountain and gets the tables of destiny and also the Ten Commandments. And then he comes down, he finds out the children of Israel have been uh, taking their gold and making it into an idol because they knew there was something magical about it. They just didn't quite know what. And it made him mad and he broke the Ten Commandments, had to go back to the mountain and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I <laughs> broke the commandments. You know, he said, can you give me some more? And God says, nope, sorry, <laughs> only one to a customer. And so this is something else we don't realize is that the Ten Commandments are copies of copies <laughs> because he broke the original ones. I just hope he remembered it at all correctly. Um, then, um, so he got mad and said, uh, and according to the Bible, he took this golden calf and he melted it down and made them drink it. Well, now, wait a minute. If you molted gold and you make somebody drink it, that's going to kill them. But this didn't kill him. So obviously he did something else. What he did was use the smelting process and turned it into the manna. The made him consume the gold in the form of monatomic powder. Uh, and where did he get it? In uh, 1904, the British archaeologist Sir William Petrie discovered what he described as a uh, Egyptian um, temple on Mount Horab in the Sinai, which is also known as the, uh, the Mount of, uh, of uh, Moses. And when they were excavating there, they pulled up the flagstones and underneath was a quantity of white powder. He says, what's this? Nobody knew. They didn't know what it was, so they just left it open and wind blew it all away. And, you know, so this is where they were making the manna. Uh, meanwhile, they were raiding and warring all through the wilderness. And after 40 years, they had collected a pretty good pile of, of uh, wealth and treasure, not only gold and silver, but uh, ancient text and uh, scrolls and things tell them about it. So now we have the story of Solomon who builds his temple there. And uh, interestingly enough, the design of Solomon's temple is an exact copy of a Sumerian temple that had been built many thousands of years before. So this tells us that this knowledge and this technology is being passed along down through the generations. But uh, unfortunately, um, it gets garbled as it goes along. Some of you may have played the old parlor game. Some of you may have played the old parlor game where you get a line of people and one of them whispers something and then you turn and whisper to the one next to you. And by the time it gets down at the end of the line, it very often does not sound much like anything like what was originally stated. But uh, up here we see also that the uh, Solomon's Temple, the actual worship place was back at the back and it was relatively small. The rest of it was this huge barn-like edifice and that's just where they stored this huge treasure so what happened to Solomon's treasure the, the probably the greatest treasure in the history of the world not only gold silver precious stones and true wealth but also a wealth of ancient knowledge okay well in 66 AD we have the Jewish revolt they uh, revolted against the Romans 
and the Romans weren't going to take that. So they came back, and in 70 A.D., they sacked Jerusalem. Well, you know, you got 66 and 70, you got four years there. So they knew the Romans would be coming back, and they knew that they would not be satisfied by just hiding the treasure because then they'd look for it and look for it. So they took half the treasure, the best half, probably some of the best knowledge particularly, and, uh, and they sealed it in the catacombs under what used to be Solomon's temple and by then had become the palace of Herod the king. And sure enough, in 70 AD, when the Romans arrive and they sack Jerusalem and they take over the uh, palace of Herod and they go through there and they get half the treasure, say. And um, they might have had the thought, well, we thought there was more than this, but that's, there it is. That's all they got. So they, where do they do with it? They haul it back to Rome as war booty. So half the treasure is in Rome. The other half is under the temple in Jerusalem. 400 years later, Alaric the Goth, who comes from southern France and uh, led a Roman army and then re revolted and uh, brought his army to Rome and sacked Rome. It was the first sacking of Rome by the, by the uh, non-Romans. And um, he gained this Solomon's treasure. And he took it back to his home stomping grounds, which were the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains in southern France, the Languedoc region. And uh, there they rested for a number of years. And the, only the people in the area knew about this, and they had access to these scrolls and to these uh, things, so they knew. And so this is what led to the Albigensian crusade. Because they did, they this gave rise uh, to the Cathars, which was a religious sect that uh, believed in purity, believed in simplicity. They believed in women <laughs> participating in the church. Uh, they didn't believe in in uh, edifices and artifacts. They they worshipped in the in the out in the woods and in the clearings and everything. Um, and, of course, that did not sit well with the Roman church, which by this time had been crystallized, uh, thanks to Paul uh, and, and Constantine, who then just declared that the Roman Empire was Christian. And uh, so they sent the Albigensian crusaders in there, and they massacred everyone they could find. Uh, this is where the line came from that the pope's uh, commander sent word back to Rome saying, well, everybody here looks like, you know, how do I know who's the Cathars and who's not? And the Pope very famously said, kill them all, let God sort them out, you know. And uh, we still are practicing that. I remember there was an officer in Vietnam who said essentially the same thing, said, kill them all, let God sort them out. So, but they didn't entirely wipe them out though, because a lot of the Cathars simply took off their robes and blended in with the population, went right on. So over, another, over time, some of the families there, uh, well, there was a, uh, they had their big uh, final stand at Monsignor, but there were surviving Cathar families like the Blanchfords and the St. Clairs and their relative St. Bernard, and they knew about the rest of the treasure over in Jerusalem. So uh, over time, they fomented the first crusade. We got to go bring freedom and democracy to the Middle East, okay? But actually, they were after the treasure. And uh, in 1099, uh, the crusaders actually did conquer Jerusalem. And uh, they immediately, the same family, these are the same people that started it all, uh, set up a military order called the Poor Knights of the Temple. And the idea was they were going to guard the roadways to Jerusalem for the uh, European missionaries and, and religious uh, people making their tracks. But they didn't really ever do that. They spent nine years excavating under Solomon's temple or under Herod's uh, palace, and they recovered the rest of Solomon's treasure. And they hauled it back to their home stomping grounds in southern France. Now, Solomon's treasure is reunited in the cave systems of the foothills of the Pyrenees. Um, 
but because of the wealth they gave, gathered plus the knowledge, these poor knights of the temple, which uh, became known as the Knights Templars, became very strong and wealthy and became a competitor to the Roman church. Um, and they had did all kinds of things, other than a lot of wealth, other than a lot of money. They uh, were the first, they had their own sailing fleet, and they were the first to use magnetic compasses. Um, in fact, something about the Templar fleet that just blew me away was we all know and love pirates, are matey, you know, vast. And, uh, but if you go back, you'll find that early on, the pirates, the people who flew the black skull and bones on a black flag, had letters of mark from England, which gave them permission, and they raided mostly French and Spanish ships. The black flag with the white skull and crossbones, it turns out, is the naval ensign of the Knights Templars. So they were carrying on the, the warfare between the church and the... Uh, and, it's amazing. Uh, and then, of course, later on, there were some freebooters who said, well, we run out of French and Spanish ships. Let's raid an English ship. And that's, of course, where they became the, 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 that's where we get the pirates. So Solomon's treasure is united again. Came from Jerusalem, ended up in the foothills of the Languedoc region. They also brought architecture to Europe before the Knights Templars. Every building in Europe had just been a block house, you know, with just stones and that's it. Maybe a turret, and that was it. They came back and started building the Gothic cathedrals. That uh, in Gothic, that uh, that name comes from the Greek "gothe," meaning magical, because they were suddenly had archways and flying buttresses and you know and stuff people had never seen before, and it was magical to them. They also is Chartres Cathedral, and I've been there. Uh, they have uh, stained glass that is so luminescent that modern science doesn't really know how they were able to do that. And another thing that got me when I went to Chartres was I, I knew about the stained glass, and so I asked some of the curators, I said, where's the oldest stained glass? And they said, well, it's in the D of uh, up the front. So I went up there, and sure enough, there's little round windows with all this beautiful stained glass in it. Well, I'm expecting to see pictures of Jesus on the cross or Mary on her donkey or, you know, biblical scenes. Uh, not, uh, no, 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 no. It was, uh, it was a uh, horoscope. Uh, a, uh, it was uh, Sagittarius and, uh, what am I trying to say here? The, a zodiac, thank you. It was a zodiac, okay? So, see, they were into this stuff. And uh, this is just, you can see some of the stained glass and some of the archways. And you can see that the, the, they're carrying on the knowledge between here's ancient Egyptian and then here's European. Uh, this, this over here was in an Egyptian temple and the other's in a Hebrew temple. So it's all the same stuff. All the same stuff. And then we find that all through the Middle Ages we have the alchemist. And what were the alchemists doing? Well, you know, popularly we know they were trying to turn lead into gold. But actually they knew that gold had some kind of magical property and they were trying to figure out how to do this and how to make the white powder. And in fact, um, one of the alchemists, Arrhenius Valenius, said, our stone is nothing but gold digested to the highest degree of purity and subtle fixation of very fine powder. So the philosopher's stone was a white powder. This is the white powder of gold. And this became known to a village priest named uh, Brignier, uh, Sonnier, uh, at uh, rennes la chateau a little hilltop village in southern France in the Pyrenees. And he suddenly became very rich and was hobnobbing with the Habsburgs and some of the other royal leaders of Europe. And uh, because of something he had learned, and we don't quite know what it was, it's a big mystery. If you ever read Holy Blood, Holy Grail, that's uh, what they're talking about. And um, apparently, though, he did tell his live-in housekeeper uh, his secret, and she promised to tell uh, one of her close friends before she died, but 
didn't make it. She died and she still didn't tell him. And so we don't know precisely what it was, but I, we, it is surmised that uh, Father Sonnier uh, knew where the Solomon's treasure was located and may have gotten the bits and pieces of here and there. And that's why the royals were all after him because everybody wanted that. Uh, you can see that the Masonic, uh, uh, you know, the, here's Rensselaer Chateau, and here's a, a diagram of Washington, D.C. It's all done by the Masons. The Masons are the offshoots of the Knights Templars because the Knights Templars became the rivals of the Vatican, and they moved against them in 13, whatever it is, 1311, I believe. On, on a Friday, which is Friday the 13th, that's where we get that boogaboo. And uh, so they, by then, the Templars had broken into two main groups. They had speculative Freemasonry and operative Freemasonry. Because at the time, early on in the Knights Templar, when they realized they were going to have a problem with the Vatican, they began to form stone mason guilds. I mean, the reason for that was is that stone mason guilds, these are the masons that would go around from town to town and build the cathedrals in uh, the cities of Europe. And as such, they were among the only group that was able to freely travel around Europe during the uh, Middle Ages. And so this was their way of uh, having a communication information system. So they formed these stone mason guilds, and then it broke into operative and speculative. Well, operative, these were the guys that were real stone masons and actually built things. And then speculative were people like us that wanted to join, wanted to learn some of the secrets and wanted to be a member, but were not actually hands-on masons. So they built Washington. They helped build the United States. and. Uh, Okay, just briefly here, you might have seen the Dan Brown uh, thing, uh, his famous book and the, the movie. Uh, and, hmm? The Da Vinci Code? Yeah, the Da Vinci Code. And uh, they're talking about, in the famous picture of, uh, of Jesus' Last Supper, you can see there's a distinctive V shape there that separates him from the figure to his right. And if you'll go and look at all the other figures, they've all got beards and they're pretty husky looking. And this one, who they try to say is John, but this is actually uh, Mary Magdalene, his wife. And in France today, that's just, it's like, oh yeah, we all know that. Because while I was at Rensselaer Chateau, I'm looking out and I see there's a very obvious cave over here across the valley. And, and uh, this uh, uh, professor that I was with from Belgium says, oh yeah, that's uh, the cave of Mary Magdalene. I said, oh, 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 they named it after her? And he said, no, that's where she lived. <laughs> All right, because according to their story, uh, after the crucifixion, Mary Magdalene, uh, Jesus' wife, and uh, his children uh, fled and landed in southern France and that's where they lived, and that's where you get into a whole thing about that they blended with and, and intermarried in the, the bloodlines there and created the Merovingians, the, uh, the would-be kings, uh, the, the uh, poet kings of Europe. But uh, it, it, obviously, but then they argued, no, 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 that was just John, and he was kind of effeminate looking. And yet I found three examples of the Last Supper, one by Durer, one by Fuqua, and uh, another early German thing, and all three of them show Jesus there with a woman. So see, we've been uh, kind of uh, messed around on that whole story. Uh, also, from Rensselaer Chateau, if you'll take some of the holy places that they're already marking around there, we find that it's all a huge uh, pentagram type shape uh, and in fact, it's called the Temple of Isis. So you've got this feminine aspect to the whole thing that we don't usually get told about. And of course, the Ark of the Covenant is a big part of that in this uh, Nicholas Poussin painting. Um, back over here, you see in the background the Ark of the Covenant. And in fact, the Ark of Covenant has been revered all the way down through the centuries. Uh, here's a Knights Templar meeting in Paris in 1147. They got the Ark. 
in the Royal Ark Room today in Washington, D.C. The Ark's a big piece of uh, Freemasonry. And we now know that the, uh, what the Ark looked like because the Bible gives us the dimensions. And uh, the lid or the mercy seat is three and a half inches thick, made of pure gold. Estimated to weigh 2,714 pounds. And yet we see the illustrations and descriptions of four or five guys carrying it around. How, how, they, how can they carry that kind of weight? Well, wait a minute. It's full of the white powder. The white powder has anti-gravity properties. So they're not carrying it around. They're just guiding it. <laughs> Okay, and not only has it got anti-gravity properties, but apparently uh, they somehow use it as a communication device because on several occasions they say they were able to talk to God through the mercy seat. And it was also pro probably some kind of super conductor because when certain people would run up and try to put their hands on it, they'd shock them or kill them. All right, so there's obviously something going on there. And again, it's back to the ancient technology. Uh, we're beginning now to find this out here because they've got a ceramic superconductor that is able to uh, hang that in midair, anti-gravity in action. And so uh, <laughs> was the Ark of the Covenant a low-frequency wave field superconductor uh, capable of creating a Meissner field? <laughs> which can nullify a magnetic field of gravity. And by the way, if you hadn't figured it out, this is what makes the UFOs fly. They, they don't use jets. They, use, they ride energy fields, and they are surrounded by energy fields that negate gravity. But also, what we're finding out is, they not only negate gravity, they negate time. Okay, the story is when the UFO field comes over, the car stops. And then when the UFO goes away, the car starts again, it's okay. Except nobody ever said, yeah, the UFO went away and mm, mm, started a car, mm, 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 started the starter, you know. No. When the field comes in there and it's nullifying the gravity and allowing the craft to move and hover, time stops. The pistons stop. And then when it goes away, the pistons go back to banking and then the thing's working again. This also explains another phenomenon of the UFO issue, which is missing time. Guy says, I saw a UFO at six o'clock and then I rushed home, but I didn't get home till seven o'clock, but I only lived five minutes away. What happened to the time? Well, he's in the, he's in the uh, energy field. Time stands still for him.